With connectivity solutions from Cambium Networks, enterprises, managed service providers, and broadband network operators have a proven solution to deliver connectivity while reducing costs. Our solutions are reliable, so operators can deploy indoor and outdoor Wi-Fi and wireless broadband networks with confidence that they will work from launch through the long haul. Contact Cambium Networks to improve your connectivity today. All right, let's get started. Hello, I'm uh, Garrett Nagelhout, CEO of Prasim. Welcome to our session on staying in the big league for WISP with uh, over 10,000 subscribers as part of the first ever WISP Virtual Summit 2020. We're really excited to present to you a WISP industry conference and expo virtually. This event is hosted by Preseam and supported by WISPA and many of the leading vendors from our industry. Today, we're gonna to be talking about some of the strategies that other WISP have used to get to 10,000 customers and continue to grow from there. And we have a really awesome set of panelists to share their experience uh, and knowledge about this. Our panelists for the sessions, for the session are Nathan Stuck, who is the CEO of Whisper Internet. Nathan went from programming PCs to building Whisper into a very successful business in the last 17 years and really has a wealth of knowledge on the subject. Next, uh, Gino Villarini is the founder and CEO of Aeronet Wireless Broadband and has been involved in the telecom industry for over 25 years. Chuck Hogg is the senior vice president at All Points Broadband, where he leads industry engagements, new, build, new fiber builds, and mergers and acquisitions. Prior to joining All Points, Chuck co-founded and spent 13 years growing Shelby Broadband. Once again, thanks everyone for tuning into the session. If you're interested in getting 25 points as part of the play to win free prizes contest, stay with us till the end and you'll get your free code. Okay, and at this point, uh, I'd like to hand this over to, to Nathan. Great, well, thanks so much for having me on this session. I think this is exciting to be able to do and thanks everybody for attending today. Uh, I think this is an amazing thing that's been set up and hopefully you'll you'll learn a lot. Uh, so as I said, my name is Nathan Stuke from, from Whisper. Uh, a little bit about us, we have about 138 employees. If, if you wait a week, we'll probably have about 148. We're in this huge uh, hiring hiring spree. Uh, but that's our team from about a year ago when we, we moved into our new building. Um, so I always like to know a little bit about the speakers. And a lot of you know who know me know that I was a swimmer. Uh, I did 25 kilometer uh, races and uh, that's five and a half hours worth of swimming. And a lot of people say, well, wait a minute, you swam for five and a half hours straight? And I think, so well, I, I don't do anything but but sleep for five and a half hours straight. Uh, but something you may not know about me with swimming is that uh, my wife and I started a swim team. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the growing pains and, and something that that, you know, maybe not all owners talk about. Uh, and, and it's it, it's it's interesting when you talk to people and they're like, oh, everything's going great. It's amazing. You know, owning a business is awesome. Um, but when you really, really talk to your close friends about that own other businesses, you find out it, it's really hard to own a business, right? There's a lot of things that are reliant on you and you have to make the right decisions and you have to do those things. So uh, it, it's really, really hard. And then you have a lot of people who are what I call Monday morning quarterbacks, right? It's, we've had some employees that very, very opinionated about how we should do something and how, how we did it differently or do, than they would have done. And it's interesting when you all of a sudden put them in the role of they get to make the decision and the decision they make is what we go with, ooh, they're a little bit more quiet, right? Because it, it means something different when, when your decisions are what actually gets acted upon. Uh, and the things are not always uh, better on the other side, right? Uh, you know, I always joke that the grass is always greener on the other side uh, until you get over there and found out they just spray painted it. Uh, right. So those are some things to kind of keep in mind uh, as you're kind of going through growing your business. Um, and, and the biggest thing is, as you're trying to scale up your, your company, it's really easy um, to to just, oh, you know, kind of do what you used to do. And things always kind of worked out. And but as you grow larger, cash is king. Uh, right. It is so important to have that cash and uh, available for um, uh, opportunities for growth, uh, and how are you going to handle that cash? Is it debt, or is it is it some type of equity financing, or do you have enough cash coming in from the business? And a lot of times, as you tend to grow, you need more and more cash to keep the growth going, uh, and, and that's where it, it becomes kind of challenging. That's something that you have to keep your eye on that cash because I remember back when we were starting, and we all of a sudden had to make payroll. 
you know, payroll was only $40,000 and it was relatively easy to scrape up $40,000 if we had to make payroll. Now payroll is like 180,000 to 200 some odd, 300,000. And it's a lot harder to scrape that up. Uh, so you have to have better processes in place to, to manage your cash. Um, another thing that you're going to find that's going to change as you grow over time is the dynamics of your team. Uh, you know, early on, people wore four, five, six hats. You had people that knew a little bit about everything, and it allowed you to really, really pivot very quickly and, and get things deployed and do what you needed to do. When you grow larger, you need people to specialize, and there's too much work uh, for somebody to wear five hats. They need to be wearing one hat or two hats. And you have to be careful about those silos. And, and those are silos that, that will form naturally that you kind of have to spend effort and time trying to break down those silos and try to make it where, no, we're, we're all part of the team, that it's your job is to get this done, but we're all responsible for, for, for these different aspects of the company to make sure that the customer has the best experience they possibly can. Um, you'll also have people start to feel like they're made left out of decisions. When we were smaller, we, we had a lot of employees that were involved with all of our meetings, right? I'm real big on having company meetings and we would have, you know, all, all 50 people in the company in one meeting for a whole day every month. Um, and then as we got too large and we had to break those down, some of our employees would make comments like, well, I just don't feel like we're part of the discussion, part of the discussion and part of the decision making anymore. And it's like, well, that's okay because that isn't what you're dealing with. You're dealing with something else, but you have to know that that's coming and that's, that's an okay thing that, that to have. Uh, the other part about your dynamics is that culture and employee engagement. When you're small, you, you go through the hard times together. You go through the good times together. You know everybody really, really well. And as you grow, you have to spend more and more effort on that culture and employee engagement because we all know the large guys, right? The really big guys, there's a lot of people that don't like working there and they're there just to collect the paycheck. And that's the last thing I want with my company. I want every employee to love working at Whisper. And in order to do that, I have to spend considerably more effort on my culture and my employee engagement than I ever had to before when I was smaller. Uh, the other one, this is this is a real hard one. I've, I've gone through this recently and, and I've gone through it over time uh, as well as parting ways with key slash long-term uh, employees. You know, these could be employees that were just employee of the month. They were amazing. They were the best employees in the world, but now you've grown, right? And their skill set doesn't fit what you need in your company. And and they can't grow themselves, um, so or they haven't grown themselves, or they didn't think they needed to. So, you know, sometimes you can feel like, well, it's not a good time. I really need this employee. Well, there's never a good time, right? And when I look back at some of the employees that I should have maneuvered around either to a different place in the company or out of the company. Well, shucks, it would have been a lot easier when I only had five thousand customers versus now twenty two thousand customers or twenty thousand customers. It's like, gee, that's a that, that's an even bigger issue now. Uh, sometimes you're going to feel like you're, you're held hostage, right? That you have some really, really good employees or they have a lot of institutional knowledge. They've been with you from the beginning and they just know how your system runs. Um, and you have to be willing to say, no, I'm not going to be held hostage. Um, and the company will survive. I've always preached that I don't want the company to revolve, revolve around any one employee, including myself. Um, and sometimes that's hard, right? Sometimes that's hard to get the cross training, hard to share that institutional knowledge. But when you start when you're small, it's so much easier to make changes when you're larger. Um, you know, and then another way we look at this, this is a question to ask yourself. If they left today, what would you do? And, and if the world would, you know, the sky is falling and you have all these problems and you're not sure, you need to figure out a plan, right? Because maybe they win. HR says I'm not allowed to say hit by a bus anymore, but let's say they won the lottery, right? And they're leaving the company. Uh, they won the lottery. And what would you do? What would someone else do? What would someone else looking in from the outside do? And, and sometimes you need that perspective. Um, so it, it's never fun to part with uh, key long-term employees, but it's something that you'll you'll probably have to do, or you'll you'll hit a lid, right? And you just won't grow any further. You won't grow any further. You'll have an Achilles heel, if you will, and you you have to deal with that sooner than later. And I would encourage you to deal with it sooner. I, I know it's hard and, and I've drug my feet on it and everything, but after you get over the hump of actually doing it, then it's like, oh, amazing. This is awesome. This is exactly what we needed to do. Um, the other thing that happens as you're growing, especially when you're growing really, really fast, is people tend to band-aid things. I don't even know if band-aiding is a, is a term or a word, but I'll use it, band-aiding, right? I've, I've been a consultant in the IT industry for a really long time. And 
when I would go into companies, I would say, well, why are you doing this? And then they would, in the process of explaining to me why they were doing it, they would remove like four steps. Cause it's like, well, why did, I don't know why we're doing that anymore. We don't need to do that anymore. So really when you think about it, you need to peel back your problems and get to the underlying cause of the problem, not just fixing and adding a Band-Aid on top of a Band-Aid on top of a Band-Aid. And um, when you're growing fast, it's really hard. And, and sometimes you have to go grow inefficient first to then be able to come back around and say, okay, now it's time for me to go back and revamp things and totally change because now I have more resources, I have more things available to me, or I have a better understanding of what I need. Um, and a lot of that comes down to having a strategic plan. You know, when you're when you're smaller, it, it's yes, the plan is to get bigger. Okay, well, when you're bigger, then you have more resources at your disposal, and it takes a longer time to shift, right? To to shift the 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 st strategic direction of your company or what you're doing. So you have to spend more effort on trying to to do that. And one way to solve some of the band-aiding, if you will, is to have a strategic plan. When we're making our decisions, what are we trying to solve long term? And maybe we can't solve it long term, but we'll solve it short term in a way that gets us to our long term uh, plans. So how do you deal with all these growing pains? Um, leadership, 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 leadership. I, I, I can't stress that enough. You have to elevate yourself as a leader as you grow your company. And, and I, I always remember when I, you know, back in the day when we were out of my garage, right? I, I would wake up at nine o'clock in the morning after staying up until six o'clock in the morning. I'd come out in my shorts and t-shirt, say hi to the guys in my garage and tell them I'm going to go take a shower and, and I'm going to go off to a meeting I have. And, and that was totally fine for having five people in the company, having somebody literally move my wife's car out of the garage and, and come back and, and set up the table to work. Fast forward now, I, I, I wouldn't want to necessarily have that personification because of who I am, because while I'm not you know, coat and tie stuffy corporate, there are more things that I need to be taking care of and there's different things that I'm doing. So it's interesting as you bring on new employees, they don't have any of the old baggage from like, oh, Nathan, you're the CEO that used to do this. And no, no, I've grown as a CEO. I've become better. I make better decisions now. I've learned from my, my mistakes in the past. And, and that's why I try to lead by example. Um, I, I love that if I love working with other business owners and leaders that know they don't know everything. Um, when you meet somebody who has to know everything and has to have be the smartest one in the room, you will always hit a limit. I I want to hire people smarter than me. Please, by all means, be a better marketing person, be a better networking person, be a better anything. Because if you're not, why why would I hire you? I could just do the work. And, and so that's the way I look at things. And I, I would love to be perceived as the dumbest person in the room. That would be perfect uh, because that means that I've hired a really, really good team and they really, really know what they're doing. Uh, the other thing I would encourage you to do is um, be be the captain of your company, right? So set the, set the culture. The culture starts at the top. Uh, and if you're not setting the culture, uh, no one else is. Or the person you don't want to set the culture is setting the culture. And that, that's something that really, really uh, is something I learned the hard way is that I had to be the one responsible for the culture. Uh, so with that, uh, here's my contact information. I, I'd love to take any questions at the end of this. I, I think it'll be great. Uh, the last thing I'll do is our, our Whisper University for, our, we're doing Built to Lead, which is leadership and it's free. Uh, and we're, we're getting that out there to everybody. You can join it to, for free and we're, we're facilitating that. And we'd love to help everybody become better leaders. And with that, thank you so much for, for your time. Thank you so much, Nathan. That was really useful. I uh, I find, I'm not running a whisk myself, but related business, of course, and that same advice is super helpful, mm. I think, for me as well. So, so thank you for that. Thanks. All right, over to our next panelist here, Gino. Well, thank you very much, Jared. Uh, hey, Nathan, uh, thank you very much for those uh, uh, very uh, great, uh, I think it was a great advice. I even took notes from some of it, so yeah, great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, thank you all, uh, panel, and thank you for the invitation to be part of this presentation. I'm really uh, happy to be here and thank you for all the visitors and all the attendees that are attending the first virtual Lewis conference. All right, so a little bit about uh, me, well, not about me, about the company that I represent, uh, Aeronet. I founded Aeronet back in 2001. We were a fixed sport as provided mainly and uh, as of five years ago, we started to implement fiber in our network. We serve the island of Puerto Rico, uh, USAVI and South Florida. 
the USBI and South Florida networks, we have a partnership with uh, local providers that assist us with the last mile. And then uh, the markets that we serve are mainly uh, small and medium businesses that represent 67% of our customers. And the residential market, we have 33% market share within our business. Uh, total customers, we're about 10,500. And uh, employee-wise, I, I didn't include it here, but uh, we're about 65 employees as of today. I would like to give you a couple of uh, advice based on my experience in the market. I've been here uh, almost 20 years with the company. So I think that uh, by experience, I, I have a, a lot of value to provide. So I will say that in terms of business, uh, you first and foremost, you need to define your market and the services that you want to provide. Uh, you cannot try, you cannot go around and try to be a tool for everyone. Uh, that, that will limit basically what you can do or, or provide with your company. You have to really focus on which markets you want to serve, be it a big by residential or business uh, or even wholesale. And then uh, obviously demark that by the geographic area that you will provide the service. Um, and by services, I mean, which kind of, what kind of services, you know, it's going to be broadband, it's going to be dedicated internet access, going to be uh, uh, asymmetric and define really well your services because by defining your services and your market, you will know how to uh, make a strategic plan out of that. And then with, with that in mind, you have to plan your network for growth. And by that, I mean that this is a little bit more on the technical side, but as you plan your network, the infrastructure that you use, or the tools that you're going to use for your network, you need to plan ahead and, and think about where you want to be two years down the road, five years down the road in terms of equipment and network. That will save you a lot of time and money going back to your network and rebuilding everything. Uh, being through that, being there, obviously the technologies that we have, we usually, uh, they don't last more than possibly four or five years. Uh, and, and, and in the in especially in the wireless side of things, but other other part of your network, you can plan ahead for a longer term of, of, of technology. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, we've been through this uh, several times within our last 19 years. And uh, sometimes I think to myself, I, I wish I had done this differently uh, back maybe five or 10 years ago. And uh, in the long term, uh, at first it will seem that you're gonna invest uh, more uh, in money into your deployment, but uh, it's going to be uh, worthwhile uh, later on. And within that, also standardize as much as you can as you can within your network. Uh, when you have a standard network and you use the same equipment all over, it will help you basically uh, have the tools to grow your your employee base, your employees will not have to be focused on learning different kind of equipment, different kind of routers, switches, and network devices or radios or fiber networks. They can focus to on learning how, uh, to manage and grow your your standardized network. You know, just this, a couple of models of routers, got models of, of IT infrastructure, a couple of RAN or radio access network infrastructure. So that way that will easily uh, help you grow your your employees and your company and also automation automation uh, it, it's a big one for me right now uh, we're doing as much as we can to automate all the processes that we can we hired a uh, team of developers to help with it help us with this so this also will help you grow your company uh, and and obviously provide a lot of efficiencies in your operation and lastly within the business advice I will say you know collect data and, and chart together some a uh, lot of KPIs. Uh, you know, uh, data nowadays is, is basically a, a currency for success. So it's more more data that you have, you can analyze and make this proper decisions based on the, on the data available. If you don't have any data or have a very limited data, the decisions will be out of a whim or out of a hunch. And that's, you don't want that. You need, you need hard data to make good decisions. And obviously, measure it and present it via KPIs. One thing that uh, I would like to point out, uh, I'm recently uh, taking a course uh, by uh, Harvard Business School and uh, I stumbled into 
this. And I think it's, it's perfect and it's very powerful. You need to create solutions for your customers. And they, uh, on the course, I learned that uh, you need to think that your customer needs a job to be done. And then they're hiring your company to do that job. And by job, I mean, and, and you need to take this into perspective, you're not providing internet access. You're providing a lot more. You're providing communication, communication tools. You're providing entertainment tools. So you need to focus on what your customer really needs to be done in their end, and then you provide the solutions to them. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, uh, uh, search uh, Disrupted Innovations by Clay Christensen on YouTube. You can learn more about that. And that I included a tiny URL there, so you can go, guys can go in and check it out. Okay, in terms of marketing, uh, which I think is uh, one of the most important components on your company, first of all, uh, you don't you you cannot be afraid of the competition. Uh, here in Puerto Rico, the market is very competitive. Uh, we have you know the local ILEC, local CLEX, uh, big companies, uh, but there's always always a space for you to compete, even with the big guys. Uh, you cannot be afraid of them or uh, the whole market. So having said that, you need to really focus on what kind of niche you want to serve and be the best at, at that niche. And then when you're best in that niche, then you can expand to other, other areas within your market. Communicate the problem that you're solving with your marketing and your communications. You need to expose what you are solving from the end user. And that really ties in with what I, I said, the Define the job to be done. Define what you, oh, that's a phone there, Green, sorry. Uh, you need to define whatever you are solving to your end user so you can communicate that well and then you can get an engagement from your customers or prospective customers. Invest in your brand and it's because it's your reputation. You need to have a great brand strategy. Uh, that, that means, you know, logo, uh, uh, social media presence, web presence, uh, branding on your vehicles, on your uniforms. You have to be very pristine about this because it is your name. You know, when someone basically, when your name is, is tarnished, uh, it, it's, it's very hard to to uh, repair that. So I would say invest pretty hard in your brand so you can so your, your name and your reputation can be forward and be on top of mind of your prospective customers. So having... Around that, social media right now is the most, the best value for your investment in marketing. Uh, most of, uh, I know a lot of WISP that are not in kind with this or do not, do not share their this vision, but in terms of marketing dollars, investing in social media is the best strategy right now. And that means not just Facebook, that means LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, even TikTok. So I, I will, I will say that please research this and invest heavily in it. And by that, also hire an expert, either internal or external. Or external. Social media marketing is a complete monster. It's something that you need to hire someone to take care of it, uh, being a marketing manager or a marketing agency. That will be my advice with that. Some sales advice and uh, with this, ties in with what I said recently, because you need to define your services and products and your markets. You can obviously <clears throat> split those into retail market and the business or wholesale. We do provide uh, services within all three markets and uh, all of them are very profitable if you focus really well on the solutions that your customers need. And the retail is very price sensitive market and uh, you can adjust to what is going on the market, but, but don't be the cheapest. Don't compete on price because as stated here, it's a race to the bottom. The business market is the highest return on it. You have the highest rate of return. Uh, it's very competed, but it's a great investment to you and to your company. So providing services in this segment will be ideal if you can. Obviously, you need to be ready to serve these customers because they are very um stringent of the requirements and the service that you provide to them is essential so have that have that on top of your mind 
You can also, within if you target a business customer, complement your basic service offering or internet access services with other services like managed infrastructure, voice or IP, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's a, a great complement to the services. And lastly, the wholesale market, uh, it's a great addition to your portfolio of services. One thing I will say, a lot of people will shun away of basically sharing your network with your competitor. Uh, maybe that's a big no-no for a lot of people, but here locally, uh, from my experience, we even serve other WISP that don't, don't have coverage in their area. And we have wholesale agreement with them to exchange services or their buy services with us. So I will say that that's a great market you can tap on, but if you do so, the wholesale team that will represent your company needs to report directly to the GM or the CEO. You cannot have them reporting to the any sales infrastructure you have within your company. That will create a lot of trust issues. Uh, so you don't want that. So my advice there would be to create trust with your customers by having a dedicated person or team within the with the wholesale accounts and report having them report to the GM or the CEO. And lastly, I will say, always be learning. Uh, being business, being an entrepreneur is a, uh, a long road and uh, you always have to be learning new stuff about technology, about your competition, about operations, about businesses. So that will be my last advice within this presentation. If you have any questions, I'll be gladly answer them later on. Uh, you can find me. Uh, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook by Gino Florini or G Florini. And thank you very much. You're also, you can send me an email to gav at aeronetpr.com. Thank you all for being here. And uh, right now I'll pass along the torch to Chuck. Chuck. I'll say just a quick uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Gino, for that. Uh, again, super helpful. Um, it's kind of the same comment as with Nathan. This, this is really kind of generic business advice. I think. As a business, knowing what you're good at and focusing and knowing what you're not good at and, and don't do that is really important. Uh, I can also vouch for having a dedicated marketing team is, is critical. You can't wear all hats yourself. Uh, so yeah, thank you again. Uh, Chuck, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Garrett. And I uh, just wanna say thanks to uh, the everybody, the pre seam staff, Garrett and Arneet for pulling this together and uh, uh, I'm honored to be up here again with uh, Nathan and, and Gino. I, I've shared the many panels with these guys over the years, and uh, you know it's uh, it's an honor to be with these guys again. Um, so uh, with that, a little bit about me. Uh, I got into the, the fixed wireless game back in 2006 uh, under uh, Shelby Wireless, and uh, evolved into Shelby Broadband. And uh, a couple years ago. Uh, we sold that business to all points and uh and i've been working with all points ever since um we focus a lot on fixed wireless access and and fiber uh, we do a lot of uh hybrid fixed wireless fiber deployments um we have a we have a few uh of the uh point to point uh wireless to fiber to the home deployments i think we were kind of one of the first uh wisp to really kind of push that forward and and uh see that model grow uh we service uh kentucky virginia west virginia maryland uh four states kind of grouped together there we've uh, acquired other companies in kentucky and and uh we cover a pretty good portion of the central kentucky area um don't focus a whole lot on the commercial side of things, but we do have a fair amount of customers that work from home uh, and are uh, farms or small to medium sized businesses that are out in rural areas. And uh, but our primary focus uh, when we first started was residential and and uh, um, we added in some commercial accounts just through people that that couldn't get service uh, through any other traditional means. And um, so our combined coverage area services, just a little over 10,000 customers. Uh, and we uh, continue to see that grow, which is, which is good. So I, I wanted to kind of say that, uh, you know, a lot of the things that, that uh, Nathan and Gino have said, uh, 
you know, are, are very important. Cash is king and, and getting your finances in order is important. And, uh, you know, planning out uh, what your strategy is and how, what your service offerings are going to be. And, and uh, you know, I, I look at, at us as, as, you know, originally we came into this and, and we're the wireless Internet service providers. But uh, uh, the reality is, is that I've been a solutions provider for forever. And, uh, you know, we're, we are solutions providers and, and we find a way to get it and we find a way to make it work. And whether that solution is, is Internet access or, or voice or or some other service that we're selling, we're always kind of like solutions providers. And, and uh, um, you know, that that's something that 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 I've kind of phrased myself as is, you know, yeah, we provide, we're an ISP, but we're, we're also a solutions provider. Uh, we have construction companies that will call us and say, Hey, I need to get service at this trailer. And, and, you know, and, and those are the solutions that we can provide that, that the tr traditional ISPs can't. So one of the things that, uh, you know, I always try to focus and, and, and try to put focus on is, is creating a customer experience plan, you know, when we, we first started looking at the ISP business, it was you know, waking up in the morning, like Nathan said, and, and rolling out of bed and, and seeing those, those guys, that, that your, your technicians that almost become a piece of your family because, you know, you're with them as much as you are with your family. And, and uh, uh, you know, and so you're just out there providing service to people. And, and a lot of your customers probably had your, your cell phone number and, and, uh, you know, and, and those are all things that are that are great as a small business, but you know, are, are those the types of solutions that can scale and and take you to the next level? And so, having a good customer experience plan of of, of what how how you intend to grow the business is very helpful. Uh, and, and I agree with with what Gino was saying is collecting data and 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 looking at those metrics and, the, and looking at scorecards and and being able to identify all the little uh, pieces of the business that you can tweak and turn the knobs on is just efficient. Uh, it's just the, the most of efficient way to be able to grow your business. And, and, and uh, you know, you, you can't identify the issues if you don't know where your problems are. And, uh, uh, and then another thing that I th thought was interesting is, is that, uh, you know, Nathan talked about, uh, you know, replacing and growing and new employees as they come and go and scaling up and growing from within. And, and uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll give my take on that as, as well. So the customer experience, you know, your, your customers are, are really your biggest advocates. Uh, when, when we would first go out and install service for a customer and uh, they had dial up or uh, maybe slow DSL or, or something like that, or maybe even satellite. And uh, as soon as you get them hooked up onto your service, they were ecstatic. All of a sudden, you know, they could do net things like Netflix and all uh, and, and communicate on the Internet like they never had before. Or, or maybe they, they had before and they were in the city and moved out to the rural area and, and they felt so disconnected because they, they didn't have an option. And so really your customers can be your biggest advocates, making, making that customer experience the best that it possibly can be, can be your best marketing material. Uh, you know, as soon as you sign that one customer up, you know, we have a, a process that we call five plus five. And that's about basically an, uh, notifying the other customers, potential customers in that area that, hey, this customer just got service. So we go five up, five back, knocking on doors, telling customers, hey, we just signed this guy up. You should, too. And um, that gives the, those potential residents an opportunity to, to kind of go back and, and say, hey, I, I heard you just got service. W what do you think? And, and, and try it out. And, and we had a lot of really good success with that. Um, you know, and, 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 and that's a really easy way to, that scales. And, and customer referrals, all those types of processes that you can put into place uh, to, to help grow that business, it just makes it really easy and cheap, uh, cheap marketing. Uh, eliminate the roadblocks. Make it easy for your customers to sign up. You know, don't just put a phone number and call me and here's my coverage map. You know, make it easy. Let's let's create like a, a contact form and and let's kind of get some data back about where our coverage is 
And, uh, you know, and as you become more advanced, you might start looking at things as from a GIS perspective and, uh, and, and look at you know what address can get what level of service and you have that data in your inventory so that when somebody comes and signs up for service, you already know what you can supply them and maybe it's fiber. So having all of that kind of information is, is essential because that's how you eliminate the roadblocks and make it easier for the customer to interact with you. Empower your, your employees. This is another key thing that I think is important because your employees are your frontline representatives of your, co your company. And so allowing them the opportunity to represent your company in, in a positive manner and, and, you know, allow them to be able to say, hey, you know, you can get this extra level of service or, uh, you know, gee, uh, I know you haven't had service for the last two weeks because I can, I can see that this was an issue and, and, and I power that, that, that te technician to be able to help solve those problems. Um, and then another piece that, that I found is that, you know, when we first signed up cu customers, we were basically, we gave them a contract and said, here, sign this and thank you very much for your, your credit card information. We're, we'll bill you monthly and have a good day, you know, and, and uh, you know, that, that might have been all right for the first start of things. But now customers want to be able to have the capability to, A, they want to log into their account. They want to be able to update their information, change their phone number, change their email address, change their credit card information. Um, or, or what happens if uh, some perspective, some a, uh, aspect of their network uh, changes and, and they need to be able to have support for that. Uh, being able to identify those issues early and uh, help the customer solve their own issues uh, sooner than having them call you uh, will, will really make that customer onboarding that customer education process a whole lot better and and then the less that they call you the better that they are able to take care of themselves uh, I, I know there's a lot of times like in our hold queues for example we'll notify the customer that there's certain things that they can go and and do customer self-support or self-service just by going to the website and those are things key key things that'll help your csrs and, and eliminate unnecessary calls and, and and service calls and things like that that can really impact your business um, and then ongoing sales and marketing campaigns. Uh, you have this data from your customers. You know what service level they're on. You can tell if they need more bandwidth or not, typically. And, and so uh, uh, those are some, some key aspects to uh, helping to grow that business. So quickly, I'll go through some things here on scorecards. You know, what are the meaningful goals and targets? You know, are we looking at ARPU? Are we looking at, uh, you know, net revenue lost or net revenue gain? You know, all these different pieces to the puzzle. Um, you know, are we having a lot of slow browsing tickets? You know, and then a regular review. Of, are these metrics important to us still? Are, do, do they still make sense? and understanding that data and the reports and, and, and where can we make these tweaks and identify the problems that you might have. And so going back, you know, automating the processes for your customers just to make these tasks easier. You know, planning now for today makes tomorrow's for tomorrow's success. So with it, without a good plan, you know, you, you just are basically flying at the hip and that typically doesn't, uh, result in, in favorable outcomes. And uh, getting there quickly, uh, you know, you can take a lot of time learning how to do things. You can take a lot of time, you know, digging into Facebook or social marketing, but you really should find experts. Use consultants so that that's specifically what they do. You'll find that the amount of the time and, and money spent and working with those guys far exceeds the amount of time and effort that you'll ever put into it. And then uh, again, you know, today's installer may not necessarily be tomorrow's manager. So while those guys that you wake up with today and go out and get in the field and climb up on the towers and, and you know, you make really good relationships with them, uh, as you grow, they may not be the best manager and they may not have the best relationships with other employees. And so those are the things that, that you need to think about. And any questions? You can find me at uh, Seahog at allpointsbroadband.com and uh, Twitter and some other places at Chuck Hogg. Thank you so much for that, uh, Chuck. That's uh, sounds super helpful as well. I, uh, I really like the advice on the scaling side. I, I went through the same thing myself where when you start out as a company, 
you speak to or interact with every customer yourself. And it's really scary to get to the point where that is no longer the case. So how do you build a team that can do that for you and still deliver that same experience that, that you're used to um, at that point? Um, all right, so play to win. Um, the code for this session is big leak. You can see the spelling and all that uh, right here. Um, find the play to win tab on the left. Look for owner special staying in the big league session and enter the code above uh, to get 20 points. Um, we've got a few minutes left here, so I'll just uh, sneak in a couple of questions. Um, Nathan, the first one's for you. You spoke quite a bit about culture and things like that. When you think about um, hiring and hiring new employees, what do you look for to make sure that culture stays intact? Yeah, that, that's such a such an important thing because especially as as you hire more and more people, there there might be more people at your company that have been there for a shorter time than have been there for a longer time. And uh, what we look for is attitude and work ethic. If you have a good attitude and a good work ethic, we can teach you to do anything. And that's where it becomes so important as you add to that culture. And the other thing we look at is they have to match our culture. It doesn't mean our culture is right. It doesn't mean our culture is better than somebody else's, but we want to make sure you match our culture. And we go through that with our core values and, and step through. And it's so important that the right people fit in. Um, so then you can focus on growing and going instead of dealing with all the drama that comes along with having a bad cultural fit. Yeah. Awesome. Gino, Chuck, anything you want to add to that as well? No, I don't think I'd really counter it, but I'd say that, uh, you know, the people that are, your, your culture is going to evolve. And uh, as your culture evolves, then the people that you hire and the types of people that you hire will evolve. And, uh, you know, again, going back to the, uh, the statement that I made earlier, the, the technicians that you hire today that are your best friends to get you started will not be or may not be always the ones that will be there once you hit a, a larger size. Mm -hmm. yep. I will add that uh, for us also uh, communication skills are very important. Uh, you want an employee that's able to communicate pretty well with their rest of the team. So I will add that to what to what Chuck and Nathan says, which is basically some set up pretty well. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Um, Gino, you talked about uh, metrics a fair bit. What are the top three business metrics that uh, any operator should track? All right. Uh, at least for us, uh, ARPU is pretty important. Uh, we try to obviously uh, uh, grow it every month. Um, monthly grow, how much percentage of your invoicing grew uh, month after month, and uh, the cost of uh, service provided or the cost of goods sold. I think that those three sums mm -hmm. up pretty well the, what you need to look for. Yeah, cool. Chuck, Nathan, anything to add to that? Perfect. All good? <laughs> yeah, I'd say our variation is just some variation of ARPU. So, uh, right. mm -hmm. so those are those are all valid. Uh, I, I will add, if there's a, a space for a fourth, um, your uh, monthly churn. That's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, was kill you. Add, I was gonna add churn and, and, and we look at churn in a couple of different, in what, couple of different ways, but we also look at churn as, uh, you know, what, what was the age of the churn? Um, you know, how, how long had we had that customer? Um, and then uh, we also look at what was the uh, um, average monthly rate uh, that was in the churn. So, you know, are, are we losing customers at a lower rate or are we losing customers at a higher rate? We can tell if we're pricing ourselves out of certain markets that way. And, some yeah, other, other metrics like that. But a we lot add of to that around the, ARPU. Yeah, we add to that the frequency, right? So, or the type of service. Is it a 900 megahertz customer or a five gig? Is it fiber? What are we What are we churning? So, yeah, absolutely, all 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 very good. Okay, uh, one last one for all. Uh, what are some of your biggest lessons learned or mistakes made? I'm sure there's some good. Keep them short, but some good stories there. <laughs> uh, quickly, I will add uh, not starting advertisement and marketing sooner. I thought that word of mouth was uh, plenty uh, at first, and then I re later realized that I really missed a lot of opportunities because of that. Yeah. 
Uh, I think I think for me, uh, the aversion to spending money. I, I didn't like to go out and you know get a loan and, and a lease and a, running up my credit card debt. I, I really didn't like that. Um, and, and so a lot of our growth was uh, based off of uh, cash on hand, and we had other businesses to support the WISP. So uh, cash on hand was was fairly accessible for us at the beginning. Um, but to take it to the next level is when I had to really kind of learn about debt and how to manage debt and and uh, uh, use that to the, the advantage of, of really kind of like, you know, exploding the growth, I guess, if you will, of, of the company and what we were able to do. I can so relate. Maybe, yeah. maybe taking that on a little bit earlier. Right. I, I think for me, the biggest lesson learned is um, it won't all get fixed when you get bigger. Um, you know, I, if you had asked me five years ago, 10 years ago, if you could, if I could have $80,000 a month to spend on equipment, would that solve my problems? And I would be like, yes, that'd be amazing. 80,000, you know, and now we're spending like two to 300,000 a month. And it's like, oh, if I just had a little bit more. And then I, I made that comment when I was on a panel with Jeff Kohler from, from Rise. And he looked at me and said, man, we spend like a million plus a month. And I just wish I had a little bit more. I'm like, oh, don't say that. Don't say that, you know. So it's you have to put things in processes and, and, and know that you, you're not going to be able to get to all the opportunities out there. But that's OK. What are the priorities that you've chosen to, to go for? Uh, and getting bigger doesn't fix all your problems. So. All right, awesome. Uh, thank you so much for, for all that. That was, was really, really excellent. Uh, at this point, uh, we will be around for, uh, for some questions you can type in as well. Um, so head over to the group discussion tab and look for um, uh, this session's name, the, the, the big league one, and let's keep the, the conversation going. Thank you. Thanks, thank everybody. You. That was great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for tuning into this session at the WISP Virtual Summit. Proudly presented by Perseem. Perseem is a unique networking solution that helps WISPs measure, analyze, and optimize the quality of experience they deliver to their subscribers. Perseem helps WISPs lower churn, reduce support calls, and increase revenue. To learn more, visit Perseem.com.